Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organisation sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others and the planet. I'm your host, Brad Jennings, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. Welcome to episode 19 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. I have with me today Mr. Kevin Eyre, the founder and director of Soundwave Global. Kevin has had an extensive career in the field of enterprise excellence, leading and consulting in change management within some of our largest manufacturers, finance institutions, and supply chains. Kevin is here today to talk to us about the power of leadership language in transformation programs. Let's get into the episode. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Pleasure, Brad. Thanks for having me. Kevin, what what first triggered your interest in getting involved in organisational change? Yeah, it's a good question. I I, I don't think when I was, um, you know, 10 or 11 and first thinking about careers, it was the first thing that ever came to mind. Um, but I've always had a really strong interest in learning. That was probably the trigger point. So my, my early career uh, or early life experience really is one of not performing very well in education and then at a slightly later stage in life, performing very well in education. And also seeing people around me who really benefited, really benefited socially through, through learning and education. And I was always struck with this question, you know, how is it some people seem to enjoy and benefit from learning in an academic sense and, and other people really don't? And what, what impact does that have on the sort of career choices they have? And I think some of that early thinking, which is arguably more sort of educationally focused, as I began work and started to find myself in organisations, I had the same questions, but probably just in a different context. You know, inside an organisation, what's helping or hindering performance and what's the relationship between performance and learning? And you don't have to be around it very long before you start to see that, you know, at an intuitive level, there are quite strong connections, you know, where where learning is poor performance seems to be poor where learning is good performance seems to be better so that was some of some of the early interest in that well that's that's intuitive that's interesting Kevin, what was it that triggered it for you can you go back to that like for you what was the trigger point from not enjoying learning to then enjoying learning yourself Uh, well i think a lot of this has to do with you know social context and um I mean, I have, a, I have a son now who's in his uh, mid-twenties who's um, recently qualified as a teacher and a uh, school teacher. And he's, he's working in schools which, you know, have some challenges around them. And I think I went to a school which had some reasonable challenges around it and wasn't, wasn't a very academic school. So expectations, social expectations are low. And people tend to respond to the expectations around them. You know, if you have teaching staff at school, and I'm going back many years now, but you have teaching staff at school who are preparing you for life in a factory when you're 11 or 12 years old, and your parents perhaps work in factories doing relatively modest jobs, and the educational system is set up so that you're streamed into a role in a factory when you leave school is quite a difficult thing to break out of. And so, you know, the institutions around us create uh, pathways for people and some people can break out of those pathways with various types of help, but a lot of people can't. A lot of people find that, you know, they, they're quite happy being subsumed in the expectations around them and I'm not making any criticism for that, but the fact of the matter is, you know, that, that tends to inhibit things like social mobility. And I guess I was lucky in that um, I had, I started to take a bit of an interest at school in education. And as a consequence of that, I had some teachers who took an interest in me. And, and the, two, the two things tended to work well together. I took an interest, started to work a bit. Uh, they responded by taking an interest and helping a bit more. And that sort of spiralled. And, you know, I, I went from somebody who um, at the age of 11 
failed the infamous 11 plus and went to a very modest school um, to somebody who ended up doing a master's degree at the London School of Economics. And, um, you know, and so that sort of educational transition is, was important for me personally. I'm not saying it's the sort of path that other people ought necessarily to take. But for me, it was personally liberating. You know, it, it changed the trajectory of my life. And it's probably down to the interest of one or two teachers who I, you know, still fondly remember. And, um, and I think exposure to subject content at school that was just really interesting um so george orwell's animal farm for instance you know was just a a life-changing read suddenly all sorts of things open up before you um and i suppose a lot of kids need that you know a lot of kids at school need to find things that they can be really excited about wherever it then might take them um so I didn't really imagine that we'd start at this point today, Brad, but, you know, <laughs> thank you for asking me these questions. Well, it's, it's, it's quite relevant, isn't it? Like I, I'm, I'm always yeah. interested in hearing the backstory, Kevin, because it often there's connectedness. How, yeah. how did you go from economics into human resources and change management? Do you mind explaining? Because I know you, you went to the London School Economics. Yeah, so I did a, I did a first degree um, at, Exeter University, um, which was in mainly political theory, which is a degree in politics, and then my main interest was political theory, political philosophy. Um, and I got into this curious uh, piece of fascination with a, with a little known uh, 18th century political thinker called William Godwin, who sometimes people describe as the founding father of anarchism. And I'm not sure that's the right way to describe him. But anyway, I, I found it really quite interesting, as crazy as that sounds. Um, and so actually, and this is, this is very relevant to this conversation, I think the reason that I got really interested in political theory and came across this character called William Godwin um, was because of the language, because I was really quite taken by the, the way in which 18th century political treaties are written you know there's a there's a certain archaic style to it but there's also you know a very very sophisticated prose style you know and i found myself reading and rereading and rereading you know really getting into sort of the poetry of the language um but uh, but underpinning that was interest really in i suppose what we call today social sciences so um, the political theory uh, crossed over into some economic theory and so I went to the LSE and did a taught masters there for a year um, in the economic history department so that I could look at the development of social political economic theories and I was interested so I went from um, studying this little known character called William Godwin to studying a better known character called Malthus and his theories of population, and then discovered actually that um, a lot of the work of Malthus, the original work of Malthus, which you know, became very famous for one particular reason, uh, actually began as a part of correspondence between himself and this uh, uh, proto-anarchist William Godwin. Um, so I was able to write a little more about that. And so one of, I suppose, you know, we started and I was saying, look, always interested in um, learning. But I'm also, I've always been really interested in language and what language can do, although never from the standpoint of studying it as a, as a linguistics subject matter, always interested in the meaning that one gets from words and prose um, and how we construct meaning through conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. So those are two things that have been part of who I am for a long time. And as I've worked in consulting and in organizational life, they, they've sort of come together in a number of ways. So, Again, with, with that piece of learning and then also language, what did you discover when you got into your, your career and started to work in workplaces? What did you see that was maybe not so good and maybe some things that were good in that regard? Yeah, so... I stepped out of education and went into um, a few years working for a training and development 
consultancy, which was which was great. But in a way, you know, consultancy is just a step removed from academia sometimes. Um, and so it was only after a few years, and I probably was getting towards my late 20s by the time I went to work inside a proper business. Um, and I went to work in the aerospace industry to begin with. And this would have been in the uh, mid to late 1980s. And that was, you know, completely fascinating. You know, I'd never been in an environment like that. 5,000 people on a site, you know, 95% male, um, macho, macho, macho behavior everywhere. And um, it was a real eye opener. And, but I, and important in terms of personal development formation, because how on earth am I going to work in this sort of context? I've never been in anything like this before and you don't seem to be able to get and one of my first insights was you don't actually seem to be able to have a conversation with anybody in the sense of being taken seriously unless your sent every sentence is peppered with many expletives and the moment that happens you start to be heard and if you leave the expletives out well you're not really a real man in this environment are you so we'll, we'll best ignore you um, but I do remember, um, probably in terms of answering your question about things I saw that maybe weren't so good, horrified one day when I walked past the general manager's office to see a queue of six people waiting outside his door. And from inside the room that he was obviously entertaining one of his direct reports, all I could hear was a very raised voice. Uh, again full of expletives one person talking one person being completely silent and i walked past and i spoke to somebody that i knew and i said yeah like dave what are you doing he says well and i'll keep the language clean here but i'm basically in line it's my time about fifth in queue to go in for my weekly rollicking okay and this this was this was the dominant management style at the same at the time and so you know this is this is quite powerful stuff you sort of you encounter that and you reflect on it and you think wow this is um is this how organizations work you know is this how organizations are meant to work is this what leadership is about giving somebody a almost public dressing down on a weekly basis and yet the interesting thing about this was you know dave who i spoke to his response was just to shrug his shoulder and say well yeah, this is the way it works. I'll go in there, I'll get roasted, I'll come out and I'll carry on doing the best I possibly can until, until it won't be good enough, which it won't be because it's not been good enough for the last two years. So why should it be better next week when I go? So, you know, interesting sort of formative uh, experiences, really. So you'd gone from learning about the power of language and the power of learning through your academic career and then you've ended up in this workplace where you've learnt the colourful side of language and that exactly. the way to lead people was to give them a berating once a week. That's right. So you, you can see the contrast. And I think it was quite a difficult transition for me, actually. I think I, you know, I went in and I'd have these slightly erudite conversations with production managers who say, well, okay, we need, we, need, uh, we need a leadership development programme here, Kevin. You know, there's no leadership here. There's no leadership. And that's okay um you know so when can you get something ready for us and coming from my sort of quasi-academic background you know, i was thinking well um you know we need some time to consult with people we need to design something we need to test the design and you know blah blah so well you know probably in about three weeks three 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 months time i would be my standard response you know and it's just this look of horror on people's faces just what do you mean three months i'm talking about next monday what can you do next monday and um and i found this transition really quite difficult um i can understand because, you know, how do you how do you suddenly bridge that gap it's a fundamentally different set of expectations and it took me a while and quite a struggle actually to get to the point where i could work out how to respond in a way which would move things forward but, but not necessarily just succumb to these arbitrary requirements that people had, or at least what at the time seemed to me to be arbitrary requirements. So, yeah, it was, um, 
it was very, very different. Probably in retrospect, I ought to have done that in my early 20s rather than my late 20s, you know, but that's just the way life was. Have an earlier baptism of fire. Have an earlier baptism of fire, yeah, yeah, exactly. And when, when did you start to see some of the good side of this come together? When did you start to see some of the positive side of language coming into the workplace? Well, you know, interestingly enough, I would say it was probably at the same time. I think that um, my, my arrival in that organisation was represented a very tiny part of changes that were being made across the organisation. So there was a recognition, a growing recognition that, you know, behaving in that very aggressive way towards people probably wasn't going to turn this very underperforming organization into something that was performing so that this whole narrative if you like began about what this business has been in the past cannot be what this business is going to be in the future and that's not that wasn't some sort of idealized view of the world that was simply the sorts of products historically that we have been making the type of role that we've played um, the type of technical capabilities that we have actually are no longer required for the future we just don't have the finance to be able to do the things that we've done in the past nor will we ever have the finance to do the things in the past and the future is all about narrowing focus specializing collaboration with people perhaps we thought we'd never collaborate with and um i mean to protect the innocent i don't want to talk specifically about you know who the business is um which is a bit of a shame because the more i could say the more more uh, sense i would be making here that's fine Um, but big transformation and you know when i joined at the age of whatever it was you know 26 27 something like that i was the youngest manager in the organization I mean, most people will be time served and they would have become a manager of perhaps by the time they're 40 and so i was one of a number of people who arrived and as i say to reinforce the point a tiny piece of that because at a much more senior level a new breed of leader had started to arrive who were still pretty tough but just had a broader perspective and understood you couldn't just throttle your way to success. You know, you've got to find ways of working with people. So there was a, it, what was really fascinating was being there at a point in time where there was all this deep, deep legacy and deep, deep history that was informing current practice. And this emerging conversation about what the future is going to be like and how we even define it and how we start to move towards something it almost didn't matter what they were moving towards and on something changed and then in that context there were uh, you know my first exposure to what perhaps today we would regard as change programs or transformation programs you know so um and they, they seem to arrive like buses suddenly you know this the organization being performing as it was for quite some time decades um heavily subsidized with with public finance and then it's moving to a state where it's got to find a way of living on its own means um and of course you know so what do we do well we need to change things and so in the space of three years i think i must have been involved in you know perhaps three different change programs and and i think one of my reflections on this is that you know, the motives for doing these things was always good and always made sense. Um, But I think my learning since has been the idea that any one of them should inevitably be successful is a foolish thought. Um, And of course, they all get, and particularly going back in time, they all get positioned as we have to do this or we'll die. Uh, Actually, what seemed to be the case, it was there was at a sort of macro level this process of just trial and error going on but people not thinking about it as a process of trial and error people being in a mindset that said it has to work because if it doesn't work i won't have a job it was a really black and white perspective whereas you know the trying to shift a large organization to become something different 
is never going to happen in a very short space of time. Yeah, and it might require lots of different types of experimentation to find out actually what is going to work and what's not going to work. And um, so I think that was one of the sort of key lessons I took from that early experience. And I became you know, really, really enthusiastic about working inside change because it was it was dynamic and it was it was challenging and it was throwing up all you know a lot of the issues that i had um at the earlier part of my life been really interested in you know how are people talking to each other at this point in time um, and of course in that environment it's noise you know what in terms of language what you hear is noise you hear bad language you hear people shouting you hear people telling people what to do what you don't see or experience so much of is in today's terms we would call inquiry we don't see people investing time in really listening and really trying to understand yeah. so the quality the quality of the dialogue that people are holding is sort of a reflection of the environment they're in the question is whether you can change the dialogue to affect the context and at, we know that at a micro level one-to-one -one, you can do that can you do that at a at if you like a more societal or organizational level yeah given there's a few things you've said that are really of interest to me that you've you mentioned you're at, you're at that organization three different sort of change programs all push through to try achieve something fast to sustain a job and then you've spoken about you mentioned that any successful change program is not going to be done overnight. It's going to take a lot of experimentation. And then you also mentioned that your the language of inquiry and engaging people and understanding is so important in that. Yeah, I think the um, if, look, let me just pick up the second of those, the uh, the experimentation piece. Um, so at the time, I wouldn't have been aware of this. Well, I wouldn't have been aware of what I'm about to say, but but. With the benefit of hindsight, it just makes a lot of sense. So the the classic Deming PDA PDCA cycle, the notion that actually human beings only really have control over small changes, um, was completely absent from those early change programs. They're all big and grand and brave and massive and they require lots of encouragement and fist punching in the air um, but actually that's not how people process information it's not how people really learn and i you know i'm in more recent years the second half of my career really taken by that work in deming and i'm still um I'm still surprised, uh, even though it's been around for such a long time, how limited the understanding and application of it really is. It's actually a really challenging thing to do, you know? Yes, we plan, yes, we go and do stuff, but how much checking really goes on still? Well, you know, negligible by comparison. Um, and the connection there, you know, is with, is with inquiry. I mean, the... Um, the checking phase of that cycle is essentially about inquiring. You know, did we do what we planned to do? Did we get the outcomes we planned to get? If we did, why? If we didn't, why? You know, this is a simple process of inquiry. But the the thing that really captures my attention is the notion of you know small rapid cycles of experimentation, and then learning about how well they work, and learning about what changes as a consequence of doing that i think that's that's something that was missing at the time and of course you know since the 1980s so actually is you know the, the full thrust of the learning of um toyota and lean is only really starting still even then to drip into conscious awareness i remember the time somebody turning up with some cars which talked about uh, quality and quality circles and some experimentation had gone on in the late 70s with that but yeah no one was really that interested in it you know why would why would that be relevant you know so um i think that that idea has stuck with me and i think is a an important part of the work i now do with people which is to constantly be encouraging them 
for themselves if it's just a sort of you know one-on-one -on -one learning process so what are you going to do and you know what's your experiment what are you going to test out yeah using your language it, yeah yeah and that, and then it's a, and at the moment you're in that space you have to start thinking differently about what you're doing and you have to start talking differently about it yeah yeah kevin do you mind thinking back to what triggered you to start to develop the concept of language of leadership and sound wave. Do you, do you, well, can you remember the trigger point into that? I think it was, well, yes. Yeah, so there are, a couple, there are a couple of things. There are a couple of things. I think the, the first thing is just the, the history of my involvement in organisations. You know, that's just a, a continuous stream of input. Um, but there were a couple of things which which really struck me very, very strongly. And, um, and one of them was, um, was in a sort of lean context. So if I summarize it as best I can, yeah, observing frontline leaders in discussion with frontline personnel. And I remember being in one business with a colleague and there was a very fortunate combination of events. In a space of a couple of hours, what we saw was an operator make a mistake and a team leader come across and berate that team member. Okay. And you could see, you could see the, gest the gesticulation. You could hear the noise. Okay. You could, you could see the somewhat coward expression on the team member's face. And then as we got closer, you could hear what was being said. And, you know, it was, it was criticism and it was punishment and it was all this sort of stuff, you know, wrapped up with a, um, but of course I'm here to help you if you'd like me to help you. You know, to get completely unbelievable sort of um, process. Here's somebody who, through no fault of their own, has gone and given somebody a hard time, but knows enough to know that he's got to wrap it up and make it sound nicer than it actually was. Okay, it really doesn't land. Um, but then, in the space of um, a couple of hours in a similar part of the business, a different team member and a different team leader. And then, what happened was in part identical. What was identical was the the high level behaviour. So the team leader approaches the team member. There's no difference in this scenario than there is in scenario one. But instead of berating him, he just, you know, quietly, he reassures the individual, hey, look, something's not working here. Let's try and understand what's happened. He then asks him a series of questions, okay? As a consequence of being interested in the problem, the other individual starts to relax and starts to talk. So the team leader gets information about what's going on. And I don't need to elaborate and complete the story. And, and what struck me about this is that if we were academics, let's say, looking at that, we would describe it in terms of behavior. You know, person A did, team leader A did this, and team leader B did this. But actually, that's not what really happened. This is a face-to-face -face interaction in both cases in which the, the critical point of difference was the conversation that was held. Yeah. In, a first, in the first instance, the conversation was really, really quite brutal. In the second conversation, the conversation was about generating understanding and offering support through the generation of understanding. Now, and the moment you look at it in, from that way, you're able to answer the question, well, how do you do these things? Because the doing of them is in the talking, not in the acting. And, and more recently, this has sort of taken me to a, to a place where I'm quite critical of the obsession that academics and consultants have when it comes to looking at people and what people do by using the language of behavior. Behavior is too broad a concept. Actually, what goes on inside behavior is interaction what goes on inside interaction is talk is conversation yeah. and when you understand the dynamics of the conversation then the behavior that you're seeking to achieve becomes replicable but without it you know what you need to do but you don't quite know how to do it so you know that's so i've asked your question both about a, a sort of trigger point 
and also where that learning has now taken us in terms of the use of sound wave. It's no, that's powerful. It it really sounds to me, given like what you're saying is your intent and how you go about your conversations as a leader can actually lead to positive or negative behavior outcomes. So the language is so important to actually getting the culture that you want. The, the, the language is critical. And so when we're working with Soundwave, that's where we're starting from. I think it's also important to say, because I don't want to be misunderstood, that the other things that people do when they're interacting with each other are also really important. So you know, my, my facial expressions, my, the gestures of my hand and shoulder and body are important. They, they convey messages. They have meaning. My critique of this is we've given too much attention to that. You know, I can stand here, I can, I could just stop talking at this point, but continue to gesticulate. Yeah. And you would come to some view about what I'm doing. You might think I'm enjoying myself, I seem happy. But realistically, Brad, you'd have no idea what I was going on about. You know, language is a precision instrument. When, when we're talking, I, as I'm, you know, in this conversation here, there's lots of stuff going on. I'm not really having to think very hard about what I'm saying. You know, there's this amazing gift we have, which all humans have, which is we can express ourselves in highly intricate ways. And as, as I'm doing that, you're processing what I'm saying and you're able to come back with relevant, pertinent questions because you're listening. And this is, if you think about it, this is a phenomenon. This is quite an extraordinary thing. We do it all the time, take it completely for granted, and therefore I think the risk is we don't really think about it. We don't analyse it. We don't say, well, what are we doing? And what is the effect of the, what I'm saying and how I'm saying it just now? So we're starting there. We're sort of saying, let's understand the power of the spoken word of conversation and then back it up with this other stuff which a lot of other people are very interested in you the the non-verbal communication okay which apparently is so important and it is important but it's a part of the composition of what it is to be human and i'll go out on a limb and say non-verbal communication does not account for 60 or 70 or 80 percent of communication I mean, it really doesn't. It's, mm. it's an addition to, an emphasis on, an exclamation mark at the end of what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Now, now you're getting me into my thing. Yeah. That verbal, <laughs> so you're really saying that the power of that language and the language that you use is such a prominent piece to create behavioural outcomes, cultural outcomes, change outcomes. Uh, uh, absolutely. And we, we, we know this at a very simple level. You know, let's uh, give you an example I often use. If we've got 100 people in the room and somebody is presenting and their presentation should ordinarily take about five minutes, but actually the person is continuing to drone on after 20 minutes. So in technical sound wave terms, we say this person's moved from the voice of um, articulation to the voice of verbosity okay waffling on droning on the question is what's the effect on the hundred people in the room yeah so I can ask that question Brad what would be the effect of somebody droning on for 20 minutes on the people in the room yeah they'll be tuning out and going to sleep they'll be tuning out and going to sleep it is really not difficult to work it out and, and we're, so when we're talking about talk, about conversation, we're saying to people, look, actually, the way we use our talk can have some really very highly predictable results. Of the 100 people in the room, there will be one or two who actually have tuned in for the full 20 minutes, have enjoyed every moment of it. But the vast majority of people will have completely zoned out. This is a predictable outcome. Interestingly, though, it doesn't stop people who have a tendency from droning on to continue to drone on, even when they've had some feedback that says, you need to be careful, mate, because your droning on could send everybody to sleep. So we've got these sort of habits and preferences, yeah. which we stay with and continue to work with, um, in spite, perhaps, of knowing at some level that it's not necessarily a really effective conversational strategy.
So, the, and the reason people keep going with it is they often don't have an alternative. Well, what would I do instead? You know, if I wasn't going to drone on, what would be perhaps an even more effective thing to do that would still allow me to be engaging with people for 20 minutes, but would avoid the risk of them falling asleep? Yeah. And that's, that gets us into some of the detailed work in Soundwave. Yeah, that's interesting, Kevin, because I've had a number of people on the show talk about behavior change and the effort it takes to change behavior. Really, where we're going with the conversation now is a change in language could give you dramatic outcomes to the level of success you have. With, well, with, and with precisely. Soundwave, what part does Soundwave play, Kevin? Do you mind giving the listeners a bit of background on Soundwave and how that sort of may go about helping people evolve their language and improve? Yeah, I, yeah, I can, I can do that, Brad. Um, I'm just, just hooked into the thing you said before that. However, please go. Um, so, and I'm, so just, just remind me. I should be demonstrating perfect listening, but I'm thinking of so many things here. Um, your comment before your question to me about sound wave was on behaviour. How a number of guests <laughs> have spoken to me about behaviour change and how that takes a lot of practice and effort. Thank you. So, so let me just go there first of all. It's also related to your second question. Um, I, I think this is a really important and really interesting thing. Behavioral change takes ages. Well, that's probably true because there are core parts of us that are pretty fixed. Um, although I think it's also true to say that people, you know, the person you are today is probably not exactly the same person as you were 10 years ago we we all evolve and grow and develop so not quite as fixed as perhaps some people would have us believe but language is amazingly fluid okay so here's a really really simple thing um you know if our relationship is based on me telling you what to do all the time okay then there will be a certain dynamic and pattern that gets created um, and in its simplest terms, that probably will create some sort of relationship of dependency. Okay. Now, I could change that very radically, very quickly without you having to change yourself and without me having to change myself. And that is instead of me just telling you what to do all the time, I could shift to asking you what you think and what you think you should do. Okay. Now, I literally, if we wrote this down on paper and put A next to B, all we would see is the change of a few words and a few sentences. But the impact on you, first of all, would be considerable. And the, the change in you, in turn, would have a dramatic impact on me. So essentially what would happen is we, we would fundamentally change the nature of our relationship without having to change who we are and arguably not really changing our behavior our behavior is still one where we're engaged in face-to-face -face conversation but the mechanics of that conversation the content of it is fundamentally different okay now in a sense to move on to your second question um this is what we this is analogous to what we're doing in sound work. what we're doing is we're saying let's become aware of how we talk and the sound wave framework and model is simply a way of helping people start to look at and hear the way they talk through a sort of analytical frame you know can can i recognize when i'm inquiring can i recognize when i'm advocating actually and was i was i aware that i do quite so much advocacy compared to my inquiry Okay. Yeah. Am I constantly giving advice? So this generating a level of awareness gets me to look back at myself differently. And then we get people to answer the question we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is, so what's the effect of all of this? So if my preference is to spend 30% of my time really trying to bring people over to my point of view, um, how successful? Am I at that? What's the effect on the people around me? Have I noticed how people sometimes are avoiding me around a coffee machine? You know, have, a, have I noticed that um, I spend a lot of time preaching to the converted, but the people I really need to convert are not being converted? Okay. And then yeah. the, the, the final thing we're trying to do is to say, well, there is a huge range 
of the way in which we can talk, the way we can hold conversation, but because of habits, upbringing, preferences, and so on and so forth, maybe we use a part of that. We might use it very well, incidentally, but maybe we use a part of it. So our job is to expose the other parts to people and get them to broaden their, their range, their versatility. So we're, we're really doing three things with people and organizations are raising conscious awareness. We're helping them to understand the effects that they have on people and then work out whether they want to change the way they talk because of that. And we're also trying to build breadth so people become you know, more fluent in the way they're talking. So I see a situation like the one I described earlier with a member of my team has not undertaken the task according to standard work or they missed a milestone on a project expectation. I know I need to have a correctional conversation with that person, but I know how to do it skillfully. I know how to do it in a way that leaves them feeling respected and able to take on the learning they've got from the conversation and move forward. But I'm not prepared to avoid the conversation because I fear it might entail some sort of conflict. I will still go ahead and do that because I'm confident knowing how to do it well. Yeah. Wow. Well, so you really, you, you've got a strong system for people to truly understand their current state with their language and then explore deeply options for them to evolve their language and grow and then help them make that change. Exactly I think right. Kevin listening to you too, it's really made a lot of sense to me, the power of even one, adjustment to language you know making a simple change can create a massive impact Kevin, is there an example which you you really like to talk about or explain that you've seen through this process with a leader is there anything that comes to mind <coughs> yeah there's um yeah let me just think of somebody so I, there is somebody who immediately comes to mind who who interestingly um came across Soundwave around about five years ago, okay? Quite a, a very personable leader, um, capable, regarded well in his organization. And um, in, over the course of those five years, he's been very successful. And he's probably been more successful than in the previous part of his career. Um, and he, for whatever reason, was really struck by what he learned about himself through Soundwave. Started saying, you know, hang on, hang on, you know, I can see there are some things I'm doing here. Um, the, the big thing, so there are some, some items in this which are related to Soundwave. It's also important there are a couple of dimensions of what he does which arguably are outside of our framework, but important to mention. Um, so the first thing is that he is an individual who habitually has used the challenging voice very well. Now the voice to challenge is important for change. And he's somebody who can bring that uh, to people in a way that they hear the challenge, but they're not attacked. Okay, so he's, he's clear, intuitively, he has that understanding. But what was happening with him was that people were getting very, very used to the challenge. And you, it's like most things, if something keeps coming at you in the same form time and time again, sort of irrespective of circumstance, people stop listening. They tune out. It's just more of the same. It's more of the same. And of course, that has the effect of the deliverer trying even harder. So, you know, the challenge doesn't seem to be working, so I'll do some more challenge and therefore switches people off. Now, I'm exaggerating to make a point. So he had that as an important part of his repertoire. And uh, in first meeting, he was in a role that required lots of change. So we've got a useful match here. But what he really recognized was that he was doing very little inquiry. Okay, he wasn't really, although he thought he was understanding, the feedback he got through the process was that he really wasn't investing very much time in more deeply connecting with people, more deeply understanding what their problems perspectives were fundamentally, and then coming to a more nuanced view about how to go about stuff. So this was a bit of an eye opener for him. And so he very quickly um, invested 
some time and practice in getting really good at listening and asking really good questions of people. And, and he's gone on from that point to be just increasingly successful. In a five or six years, um, he's now in his third organization, having in the space of two years on two others, got them to a point of really good performance with excellent succession in place. And just the parent organization is now moving him to you know, the next challenge that needs sorting out. And so the, the, basic, the basic skill is iterate between inquiry and challenge. The thing that he does, which is technically outside the sound wave model, but really worth mentioning is that he does all of this with a degree of humor. Okay. okay yeah. Now, at some point, I do want to write about humor because I don't read many management textbooks that say a key criteria and quality of leadership is wit. And um, but actually, do you know? I think it might be because what what the humor does is it allows the challenge to diffuse. So challenge comes in it lands, people really hear it and take notice of it. Then he might ask some questions, okay? And then every now and again, depending what people might say back, there'll be a little uh, humorous insight that's made an observation about somebody that is uh, quite gentle, but quite amusing. So the situation is diffused and it calms and people have space to breathe. And then the next challenge will come in. Okay. Yeah. Now I sat down with this particular individual a year ago and gave him precise this feedback. How am I doing? I said, well, I, what I've noticed in time is, you know, technically you're doing this inquiry challenge thing, which is great, but there's something else you're doing, which is really important here, which is outside of our sound wave model. Well, great. Cause there are many things outside of our sound wave model. And this is the thing. And it's a really, really powerful combination. And I think also to some extent, for some people, it's a learnable characteristic. You know, everybody has the ability to be slightly humorous and to poke a bit of fun. And I, so long as it's so long as it's done proportionally, it's really powerful. Yeah, Gavin, I'd really be interested in learning more about the research you do on that in the future. We'll need to get okay. you back on down the track on a piece of humor. <laughs> I yeah, I worked for a leader twenty years ago. His name was Andy. And we were in a high growth, high pressure role, a lot of pressure. And what I found with his humor, he had, he had amazing humor. He could take you from being stressed to having a massive belly laugh in a matter of a second. And just the stress and pressure that that took off, but it cleared your brain and then got you back in the game. And it was amazing. Yeah, there's, there's some really, I need to go back to it. There is some really interesting research around the effect of humoring groups. Yeah. Um, so e either either with two people, more than two people. Um, and it has a very bonding effect. Um, some of the early work on the thinking of the, the evolution of language starts with sound rather than language, but beat, music, singing, yeah. and humor. And where these things happen in groups of people, it literally brings people together. It's a bonding mechanism. Very, very primal. And the, the effect on our state, as you've just said, Brad, is instantaneous. Okay. Yeah. So we're back to this same thing, you know. So you are Brad, you've been Brad for all of your life. You know, there are certain maybe, maybe fixed personality traits, Definitely. but your state your state of mind, your state of being can change in an instant. As a consequence, yeah. in your case, a, a good manager saying something humorous, it just allows for a complete release. Or in the example I gave earlier of somebody asking you a question rather than telling you what to do, this will change your state in the moment. And this is where I think the, and I don't propose to understand the whole thing, you know, part of my, Part of my thrill with Soundwave is it allows me the opportunity to continue to learn about this field, which is enormous and 
really interesting because the more we learn about it, the more we can transfer. We don't have to change who we are. We just have to become even more skillful inside a capability that we all already have. You yeah. know, no, nobody came into the planet uh, with the inability to ask questions. Yeah. There are a lot of people in managerial roles who aren't very good at asking questions. But this is, a, this is learned socially. So it can be unlearned socially. And people yeah. can learn to do it again better. Yeah. I, I re- remember seeing something recently, Kevin, that one key element of trust is empathy. Is someone taking the time to truly understand someone first before they try to be engaged in anything else. So they turn that empathy. And to me, that's like you say, that's using that language of inquiry. That is so important yeah. to that. Yeah. I think the, these are, these are sort of complex concepts, aren't they? Things like empathy, you know, empathy does require, um, it requires a state of mind. It requires a set of feelings. It requires not falling into traps. You know, the biggest, the biggest trap for empathy is the, 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 the pitfall of judgment. Yeah. You know, so I, my, my starting point is to judge what's going on because I need to have control. Uh, but actually, all of this stuff is about <clears throat> where we can, and it's difficult to do all the time, uh, but where we can stand back, assume everything is neutral, be curious, and go and explore. Yeah, that comes and, back to PDCA and, again. That you're making, it uh... back to, yeah, and it comes back to the openness of language, listening and inquiring. The, those, I think, are the two most critical things, given that most of managerial life is about shaping activity in people in a particular direction. You know, it requires some serious effort yeah. to, to, or practice to change that, but it's possible to change it. Kevin, I, I love where you're going with it because... For the listeners that don't know, I'm out there working with a lot of companies at different times also. And the main thing I see are leaders who are overburdened. They're stressed. They've got so many balls in the air. And a lot of the reason I believe the root cause is they've got so many balls in the air is because in a way it comes back to their language because their language is either just do this so someone becomes dependent to them or the language is I'll do that for you. I'll do that for you. I'll fix that for you. And just Absolutely. a simple change in language, like you're saying, would adjust all that. T- totally. Uh, I mean, I, and I don't want to trivialise it because what will sit behind the language will be um, a set of thoughts and a set of feelings that are driving that expression. But if you start with a language, it reveals the thoughts and the feelings. Yeah. And so very, very often, I mean, this is a great example, Brett, because very often we'll have people you know, who, who measure at perhaps a very high level on the advisory voice and sound wave. So, so, you know, conversation with them, you say, so you're giving people answers. Yeah, I do that a lot. Why do you do that? Well, you know, it's because I want to help. So you say, okay, I really understand this. So, so the motive is a profoundly good one. But what's the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is you just create dependency. You end up with more and more work to do. So your motive's good at one level, but it just backfires. So why don't we rethink the outcome you want to get here? What would be a better outcome for you and for the individual? Oh, yeah, they do things for themselves. They have, okay. So what's going to drive that? Well, not giving them the answer precisely. So what can you do instead? And so, again, I mean, I think language, focusing on the language is useful, but we do have to connect it back to how someone thinks or feels. Otherwise, it becomes a technique divorced of who they are, divorced from whom they are. And we want this to be a skill embedded with who they are. Um, But I think you can do that because, you know, language is such a practical thing. You can... You can change it quickly. You can play around with it. Yeah. Um, it's a two-way process. Yeah. I really listening to the conversation too, Kevin, some of the examples you've given. It sounds to me like language could be a capstone behavior again. You know, if you focus on changing your language behavior, you may be able to trigger other behavioral changes off the back of it. You know, that constant thought and effort at 
choosing a different path of language could then flow onto other things. I think that's right. I think that's you know the the the, the basis on which um, Soundwave is is structured is to say yeah you know, we want things to be better organizationally for people. We know there are some things that affect people and their motivation and their performance better than others. But let's pull that back into the delivery mechanism. That is the conversation. I mean, very quickly, um, respect, for instance. Okay, so there isn't an organization in the world that doesn't want to have its people respected yeah. and doesn't work hard at defining what respect is. Okay, but actually that will come down to some, th- some actions that people take. So turning up on time to somebody's meeting. Okay, this is a, you don't have to talk about that. It's something you can do. But so much of the rest of it will come down to, you know, whether when I'm talking to you, I'm also looking at my iPhone. When I'm talking to you, I'm actually listening. And I could summarize what you've been saying to me. And when I'm talking to you, I can ask you a really good question related to what you've been thinking. Then you're going to feel respected. And so two things are needed with that. The one is I've got to see you, recognize you for the person that you are, because that's a really important thing. But really to respect you, I also have to challenge you because you have an innate capacity to grow. And so I have to be doing both of those things. I have to be finding out about you and I have to be challenging you to do better and different things. Now, those two things are not easy to bring together. But language, skillfully, skillfully used, will bring those things together. And it, would, and it becomes possible for an individual to feel like they're really acknowledged whilst they're being really stretched. That's the perfect combination. That is performance. That is performance, yeah. Yeah. Kevin, you've mentioned a vision for the future around understanding humour, and I'd really love you to research that and come back on the show. <laughs> but what, what other things do you have in your vision for the future what, what's set forward for you now um well i suppose at the at the level of sound wave as a as a set of if you like interventions in organizations um the aim is to get broader appeal so a lot a lot of the work we've done with Soundwave has been into corporations Okay, so we do some very nice consultancy work, um, help organizations, love doing that stuff. But conversation doesn't just take place in organizations, you know. Um, And so there are a couple of things that we're doing. The the one is we're making the concept accessible. So um, for members of the general public who are interested in finding out about their communication style, it's possible to go onto our website and to to look at um, products that will do that. Um, And that's at a very simple level. But the other thing we're doing is giving some serious thought to moving into different types of problem space or opportunity space between people. So so one of those, for instance, is where, uh, is in the space of bilateral relationships. Now that could be colleagues at work, who are either getting on very well and want to leverage their relationship, um, or they're not getting on at all well, and they want to understand the basis for their inability to work well with each other. So we've got um, we're doing some work in there that we'll call critical relationships, which will have an application in the workplace. But as your mind is probably rushing ahead, you can also begin to see the application outside of organisational life. So yeah. in relationships outside of work. Okay, what is, what is it about the way that I'm talking to you that you find difficult? You know, when you hear me, what do you hear? Because that's not what I'm trying to say. And so we're using these sound wave tools to give people a framework against which to try to work out what's going wrong and what can be improved. And uh, I think increasingly, you know, those of us who work in Soundwave, I think we've all got this sort of sense that um, beyond the corporate world, there's this really exciting other area, other areas that we could move into. Critical relationships is one of them. The other, the other area that I'm really interested in, but time 
delimits my ability to do too much about is in is in the educational sector in schools um, either with teachers you know how how are teachers and managers of teachers working together but how do you work with kids so that so the kids can become at an early early age much more conscious of the power of communication the power of conversation much more aware of how they're using language constructively or destructively with their peers and this isn't about trying to turn the world into an anodyne place where nobody says anything offensive you know god forbid um, but it's about making people conscious of what happens when they are offensive and allowing them to make choices about whether they want to be offensive or maybe they can think of different approaches to it so that's an area that i'd be really really excited to get involved in so if we've got any any serious players in the world of education and listening to this podcast then you know please 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 get in touch okay and well, i've got to connect you with willie winyards who was on the podcast earlier with agile in education and mike rother <laughs> i've heard he's doing a lot at the moment on uh carter in education so i'm hoping to connect with mike to and down the track okay, and the funny thing is we've just looped right back to the start of the podcast we have you know, haven't your, we? your early transition <laughs> in education yeah that's powerful funny that funny that yeah it's definitely um definitely a sort of you know driving force really well you imagine um, you imagine if we could create more inspired students who may have gone one path but because of some great conversations with teachers and teachers that really took that time to understand them and more deeply and i'm not you know more ratios of that we've got more kevins and more people who are coming through loving education and learning yeah i, I think that it would make a, a phenomenal difference and i you know i i don't want to get too political about it but you know we have a we have a complex educational system in the uk we have a state sector and an independent sector the differences between those two sectors and i have in-depth experience of them both are massive absolutely massive and um, you know the one affords life chances for people that are very different to the other not in every case but as a general rule of thumb and i think if there's areas where leveling up is required societally then this is an area where there's a leveling up required mm. yeah too true uh, but um you know i suppose it, going back to where we started i was, i was fortunate in that you know you, you find one or two teachers who you have a connection with and they place an interest in you and it makes such a phenomenal difference, such a difference to how people then self-motivate. You know, I think people people's ability to self-motivate can only endure for as long as there's some reciprocity. You yeah. know, so the, when, when that interest is acknowledged and seen, and it's then supported and encouraged, then you get the catalytic effect that you're looking to get. And I know also, you know, from personal experiences in family, um, just how demanding the role of teachers in society today is. The pressures on them are phenomenal. The workload is immense. You know, they might yeah. theoretically get the summer off, but they're not getting much else off and working till 11 o'clock at night with homework marking and all this sort of stuff, you know, yeah. tough gig. There's a, a lot of correlations to the whole conversation we've had considering education too, isn't there? Kevin, my final question, and I often ask this to guests, is what have you learned recently in your area of expertise that you didn't know before? What's a recent insight that you've had? Uh, a recent insight well um there is there is a book i have recently reread um so when i was an undergraduate i i took an option in sociology and i read a book which at that time would have been about 15 years old it's called the social construction of reality by berger and luckman it's written in 1966 um, and recently, and at the time I read it and thought, wow, this is heavy going, you know, a treatise on the sociology of knowledge is the subtitle. Well, this is pretty heavy going. Anyway, I picked it up a few months ago, 
found it in a cupboard and reread it. I'm now close to having reread it for the second time. And it's still just as heavy going, which is partly why I'm rereading it for the second time. But um, it's, it's a really, really fascinating book. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is that there are two sections in the book which specifically talk about the, the role, the purpose, the effect of language and conversation in human personal and in social development. And it's the most, it's the richest, most compelling piece of writing on the subject that I think I've ever come across. It's quite, for somebody like me who's a bit obsessed by these things, you know, it's really captivating stuff. And whilst there are many things I could say about it, the thing that I found really interesting is this notion that um, in face-to-face -face communication with people when we're talking, you know, I'm talking to you now, or albeit it's slightly artificial because it's remote, uh, I'm talking to you now, I'm hearing myself talk to you. I'm sensing your reaction to me when I'm talking. I'm hearing your reaction when you might ask me questions or make me statements, make statements as a consequence of my talking. And so there's this sort of deep process of validation going on the whole time. This is not a peripheral thing in what it is to be human. This is like the most centrally profound thing. I'm in a constant process of confirming and changing who I am as a consequence of my conversation with you. Yeah. And I've probably not done justice to the way in which Berger and Luckman describe this in the way I've just described it to you. I'd recommend people take a look for themselves. But it really resonated with me because in a sense, it sort of reignited a sense of purpose. What is, what is this stuff really about? What is really getting to the heart of the essence of what it is to be human. If we can become better in this sort of God-given capability, then so much the better for everybody, particularly at a time when you know, it's easy for language to be trivialized. It's easy for communication to be spun into three word statements. Yeah. Uh, and actually situations are complex and they need skillful dialogue yeah. to, to get to the heart of them. Or, or radical statements and radical messages. Absolutely. Yeah. Too true. Yeah, and that's, that's powerful. I'll have to get that book and get that book into the show notes. Okay. Kevin, how can people reach out to you? This has been an amazing conversation. How can people reach out to you if they want to continue the conversation? See, the, the, the simplest connection is through the, uh, the Soundwave website. So it's um, World Wide Web soundwave.global. Um, there should be contact details there. You can email us. Uh, there may not be phone numbers. You can email us. Um, or you can contact me at kevinair at soundwave.global. Kevinair is all one word. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. If um, I'm a reasonably frequent user of LinkedIn, so really happy to make connections on LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for your insights and knowledge today to help us create a better future for generations to come. And thank I can you. see that you are and will continue. And thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you, Brad. What an amazing episode with Kevin Eyre. The key takeaway I took from that episode was the power of language. And the power at which a leader can evolve culture and create change purely by looking at some key language adjustments themselves. It really sounds like the sound wave model from Kevin can help with that. I've been through this myself in the past and have found it of great use. A key tactic to help is just explore your language for a day. Take that moment to just think about each conversation you have and how you could have done that differently to get a different outcome. It can be difficult to do, especially in the high pace and pressure of day-to-day -day work, but it can create amazing results if you can find those one or two things that really help you adjust your language and through that create better outcomes. Thank you, Kevin, and I hope you all gain something from that episode. Bye for now.